All right, that was Trey Gowdy, two cuts uh, in an interview that he did with Maria Bartiromo, uh, my Fox business colleague. The FBI has these Papadopoulos transcripts, and he's saying, no, this is a game changer. Even talk of their actual tapes of this that exist as well. And Gowdy just saying, hey, we're trying to find out if the Steele dossier was used for a fifth time in the intelligence assessment of the Russia probe. And Mark Meadows talking about what John Solomon, myself, DeGeneva, and so many others have said is that we have five or six buckets of information. And declassification of key Russian probe documents is around the corner. It's, it's now happening. And the information that we got last night that I went over last hour with these, you know, Loretta Lynch basically saying Jim Comey is a liar. But we already knew Jim Comey was a liar. Jim Comey is a liar because he signed the first FISA warrant. At the top, it says verified. He could not verify the Steele dossier, the bulk of information in it, but still put a signature on it because he wanted to spy, although he denies spying in that case, and then went up to Trump Tower. This was October 2016. He signed the first FISA application, January 2017, up to Trump Tower. He goes and says, oh, I just want you to know this is out there. Uh, it's salacious, but it's unverified. So he lied. When did he lie? In October, or did he lie in January to the president-elect? Or maybe did he lie both times? Because now Loretta Lynch is calling him a liar. The issue of what would be coming out, be it the transcripts or if there is this real tape, we've invited back John Solomon, who will be joining us with the definitive breaking news on this tonight at 9.00. I know you're not finished, and you're dotting the I's and crossing the T's at this hour, and <laughs> thank you for letting me pull you away from your computer, but let's talk about the declassification issue, your sources, yeah. what you're hearing. There were these transcripts of Papadopoulos and Carter Page that were intercepted well before the first FISA, in which both men made statements that contradicted the evidence that the FBI was about to put forward to the FISA case. In the case of Papadopoulos, what Papadopoulos has said is he remembers saying to this FBI informer, uh, Professor Halper, that, no, I wasn't interested in hacking uh, uh, information with the Russians, nor was the Trump campaign engaged with Russia on a hacking or election hijacking campaign, because we would have considered that treason. Where, where, yeah. Who taped those conversations? Or who we don't know. We them? believe it's the FBI, from what we know. From what my reporting indicates, the FBI working with the informant. These yeah. transcripts we know exist. We think the tapes exist. My question to you dealt with, okay, what do we know? Because I had a... I had three sources today that I confirmed with on the yep. issue of information that we've been talking about, declassifications coming out, and my quick headline is it's coming out, but it's going to be – it's not going to be one big dump one day. It's going to come out information as it is available for declassification. That's right. It will come out as it's available. I think that's right. Rather than wait months and months and months, I think the president is trying to find an efficient way to get information to the American public. And so I think as each document gets reviewed and cleared for declassification, the president's going to make it available as soon as he can so the American people can benefit from that. And keeping in mind, this is going to be occurring in a process where we're also going to get the value of the IG report, Bill Barr's review. There's going to be lots of information flowing to the American people to understand just how bad this FISA scandal was. And I think the first uh, declassification could occur as early as Thursday or, or sometime between this coming Thursday and next week. And I think I heard it, it could be as on. early as tomorrow or early yeah. next week after the holiday. I think that could be right. And it's in that window. And I think most importantly, it, it, it's what uh, we would call bucket five in the Devin Nunez list. It's what's known as the exculpatory statements text or written quotes from people like Papadopoulos and Carter Page who made exculpatory statements not knowing that they were talking to FBI informants or being recorded by intelligence agencies, uh, saying things that would debunk what was in the uh, dossier or what that was the theory of the FBI's case. And why is that important? If you get information that weighs towards the innocence of a person, it's your obligation at the FBI, at the Justice Department, to provide that to the FISA court as part of the FISA application. What we've heard from Devin Nunez and John Ratcliffe and all the people who've read this content is that those sort of pieces of innocence, those evidence of innocence was never provided to the court. That would be a, a violation of Rule 13 of the procedures of the FISA court. 
So a very, it could be the first concrete evidence in public for what we've been saying for more than two years. The FBI was cheating. It was putting its thumb on the scale, as Bill Barr said, in the FISA process to get Trump. And that's exactly what... Well, let me go back to the specific spying in this case, because we know right. that Stefan Halper was enlisted. We were not sure, either by the intelligence community, CIA perhaps, or the FBI, because they're all pointing at each other now, and a circular firing squad is formed. Clapper and Brennan saying it's Comey. Comey saying it's 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 <laughs> Brennan and Clapper and and yeah. Well, one of the classic things in the intelligence community is when the facts start coming out, the best thing you can do is create confusion, right? And I think there's a little bit of distraction, confusion going on, uh, but there's going to be a very clear record of what happened here. I believe you will find out at the period these transcripts were made. The FBI was in control of Halper. He was doing his job. I don't think there's anything that we can criticize Halper for doing. He was an informant uh, under the control of the FBI. I think the problem is after Halper gathers the information, provides it to the FBI, does the FBI put that under a rack and try to hide it because it goes against the theory of their case? And if that happened, and that's what I believe happened from my reporting, then the FBI is in a world of trouble. Okay, so they're in possession of these transcripts from 2016. The conversations uh, between the FBI informants... George Papadopoulos and Carter Page. I want to go through this slowly. They do not know they are being recorded. They don't know that they're being taped. What they, they have don't is even know the person ir- they're talking to is an informant. That's important. Right. They Clear, irrefutable, the exculpatory evidence proving that the Trump Russia collusion was always a hoax. Then why was it continuing? And what time frame are we talking about? When was this happening? Was it after the FISA application? The first one was signed. My reporting indicates that the Papadopoulos intercept at least uh, was in September, which was a month before the FISA warning. Carter Page recalls a conversation with Halper at his library in August, August 21 to 2015, two months before the FISA. If those are the recorded conversations, like my sources have led me to believe both of these occur before the very first FISA, and it's the sort of thing that should, get, should have given the FBI pause, just like what we reported last week, right? The deal breaks ranks, goes to the State Department, has an unauthorized contact there, is sharing his same dirt, tells the State Department he's got a political deadline, he's leaking to the media, he's trying to work with the FBI, he's not happy, and none of that gets disclosed to the court either. And I think that that, what we're seeing is numerous actions by the FBI, conscious actions by the FBI to hide the flaws or, or the erosion of their case and persisting to go to the court trying to put on a rosy face to the evidence that they knew was suspect, if not outright false. That's the allegation that really will be troubling to the American people. All right, quick break. More with the executive vice president and investigative columnist for The Hill, John Solomon, on the other side. All right, as we continue, uh, John Solomon, executive vice president, investigative columnist for The Hill. So I want to just put a little emphasis on this. The steel was getting, now steel at some point is fired for lying and leaking, which is interesting. And then later we find out that he's using Bruce Orr as a conduit to even get to the special counsel, even though That's in right. August of 2016, among the upper echelon and the FBI and the intelligence community and the Department of Justice that were all warned, steel hates Trump, Hillary paid for it, and it's unverified. They still used it. Now we have literally exculpatory information that was recorded with transcripts. On top of that, Steele is so desperate in proving himself political that he has this Election Day deadline. So what we're really saying here is this. The level of premeditation to commit fraud and conspiracy against the FISA courts in an attempt to alter the 2016 election results in the beginning and evolving into an effort to unseat a duly elected president are far worse than we ever knew because they were warned by Bruce Orr. They were warned by Kathleen Kavalek over at the State Department. They also knew that if they listened to the tapes that they were recording, they knew that these guys were giving exculpatory statements that should have stopped everything. That is exactly what we expect. We should let the evidence come out and evaluate it for what it is. I met with an intelligence official who had kind of gotten some pretty good insights into the state of the case in 2018. And that person said to me pretty flatly, there was far more evidence of innocence than there ever was of actionable intelligence against the Trump campaign. For someone who looked at the full file and come to walk away with that impression that the evidence of innocence was so overwhelming and the evidence of guilt was suspect, I think we're going to find out what Bob Woodward said on television not too long ago. The Steele dossier was always 
thought to be garbage. It was never considered to be a good intelligence project, and yet it was used to make the core allegations to get the court started, and all this evidence of innocence was hidden from the court to keep the court from being able to do Is that why evaluation. They, I read an article, I forgot where I read it today, but it, it, it basically came down to the wolves turning on each other and yeah. an effort to actually help, and there's two aspects to helping Hillary win and win by 100 million to zero and not letting the smelly Walmart people like me, um, I'll speak for myself, you don't give your opinions, <laughs> um, you right. know, let Donald Trump become president. But you have Clapper, Brennan, and Comey all accusing each other of being culpable for inserting the, the unverified dossier. But it was, in fact, Comey's signature. It was not Brennan's and it wasn't Clapper's. Now, all of a sudden, things have flipped. The dossier is now seen as, oh, crap, we, found, we fell for Russian disinformation because the New York Times right. is calling it that. Then we've got those guys all killing each other. Then you've got, of course, Andrew McCabe and Comey are at odds. Then you've got Comey and Rod Rosenstein at odds. odds. Remember, McCabe said no dossier. There would be no FISA warrant. Then the leaking of such. I mean, this is all – we never thought it would be this bad. This is far worse – far more premeditated, they have far more evidence that it was not the case than we ever knew, and they did it anyway. I think that um, we are beginning to see a complete portrait, and that portrait is of the greatest political dirty trick ever pulled off in American history, where U.S. intelligence, U.S. law enforcement were used as a political dirty trick to handicap a candidate and then delegitimize a, pre a presidency. And I think I'll give you one little hint of something I'm hoping to break tonight. We now know what it was that the State Department got from Christopher Steele on October 11th and sent to the FBI on October 13th. Keep in mind, that's a full week before the FISA warrant was there. When you find out tonight, when I can report what it is, what it was sent along, it was so easily disprovable that if the FBI took five minutes to evaluate Christopher Steele's credibility on this very issue that he relayed, they would have found out it was inaccurate, just like the State Department woman sitting there listening listening to him, Kathleen Kavalik, saying, wait a second, he's spinning this tale about a Russian consulate in Miami. There is no Russian consulate in Miami. Oh, i, I got to uh, run, but you're going to have all this in detail. You're gonna, you think your article right. will be coming out just as we go on the air at 9 o'clock on Fox, That's right? I'm hoping tonight, just trying to wrap it up. Yes. All right, this is a big deal. Uh, all right, great reporting as usual. Um, so many people in this equation have been literally pounding the shoe leather and working sources. John Solomon, of course, you one of them at the top. We appreciate everything you do, and thank you.